Now I'd like to welcome uh, someone that I've wanted to be in a room with for many years, um, and we're all very lucky to have him here in the room. Uh, Robert Reich, welcome to the stage. All right. Can you? <laughs> my name is my name is Robert Reich, and I'm. Um, uh, I've just published a new book called Saving Capitalism, uh, for the many, not the few. Today is the day it's uh, it's out. Uh, so I'm on a book tour, and I am so delighted that you could fit me in, because uh, this conference is very much on point. Uh, the book is about uh, the structure of the economy, the structure of modern economies, and how they are changing. Not only with regard to globalization and technological change, which are the two factors we talk about a lot in terms of what's happened to incomes and what's happened to the structure of the economy, uh, but also a third factor that we don't talk about nearly enough that is very closely related to globalization and technological change. And that third factor is politics and power. Uh, but before I get to that third factor, I think I have about 20 minutes to talk and then I want to hear your questions because it's a little bit difficult for me to tell on the basis of your faces and body language uh, whether I'm saying something that fits into what you've already been talking about. It's hard for me to parachute into your conference, uh, so I'm going to be watching your faces and body language very carefully to make sure I am fitting uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, but what I have to say is this. Uh, there is nothing new about technological displacement. It has been going on for a very long time. In my lifetime, uh, we used to have a lot of telephone operators and gas station attendants. And uh, in fact, I, there was a gas station at the end of my, my street before I went down to become Secretary of Labor in the 1990s. And it was amazing how quickly things changed because I used to go down there and talk to people and they would ask if I wanted an oil change. And I'd roll down the window, it shows you how long ago that was. Uh, and they would, uh, they were, we, you know, it was a social occasion. Uh, and then a few years later, I came back. In fact, five years, six years later, I came back from Washington, and there was nobody there. Uh, the service station was no longer a service station. It had been automated, uh, and it felt like kind of a lonely experience being there. Uh, what happened to all of those people? By the way, you know that you are no longer in the cabinet when you get in the back seat of your car and nobody's in the front seat. Uh, so what happened to those people? What happened to the telephone operators? What happened to, the, you know, I, my students uh, don't believe me when I say that I remember a time when to put money into a bank or get money out of a bank, you actually had to talk to a person. They said, remember, really? There were no ATMs? I feel like I am a relic from a different century. I am. Uh, so technological displacement has been going on. The, the only difference now, and what we see coming, is that the rate of technological displacement of employment is much faster. Uh, it used to be that many people who are technologically displaced could, with some relatively easy training, find another job. And even if they didn't get the training, they found jobs in the retail, restaurant, or hotel, hospital, uh, public transportation, surface transportation, child care, elder care, all those personal service jobs were available to them. They still are available to them. The problem is they don't pay very much. So what we're seeing is that the rate of technological displacement is increasing. The educational capacity we have to retrain people, or even to train people in the first place, education-wise, uh, to gain a foothold in an economy that is displacing as many jobs as are being displaced and will be replaced, uh, that, tech, that capacity, the educational capacity, is not keeping up nearly with a rate of technological displacement. And so it's not that people are jobless. And I want to make sure you understand the following point. The big problem is not joblessness. Uh, joblessness has to do with the business cycle. It has to do with macroeconomic policy. 
The problem is not joblessness. The problem is that people who are losing jobs because of technology, very often the new jobs they get, the non-technologically intensive jobs they get, tend to be in the service sector, the personal se service sector, in which their incomes are substantially lower. So behind the business cycle, we have a structural problem that is getting bigger and bigger. And that structural problem is that the median wage is stagnating or actually declining. This is the first recovery in history, at least since we've recorded recoveries, in which the median household income adjusted for inflation has dropped. What's going on? Well, you could say it's part of its globalization, but a big part of it is also technological displacement. And we're just on the beginning edge, because what's happening is not just a displacement of labor. We are beginning to see a displacement of knowledge. In other words, to give you some very specific examples, the two most labor-intensive professions, where you have to have a lot of skill and knowledge to get into the profession, have to do with education and healthcare. We are just on the cusp of technology taking away, replacing a lot of those knowledge intensive jobs in those two sectors. Well, what happens to all of the people in those sectors? It's not that they'll be unemployed, but they will not have jobs that pay as much as they had before. They will probably migrate, like many other people, into the personal service sector of the economy. Recent college graduates, well, you know, I used to say, in fact, I've written books about this. I wrote a book called The Work of Nations in 1991. Uh, the theme of that book was that the symbolic analysts of the future, people who could manipulate and analyze symbols, would do better and better, but they required more and more education in order to do better and better. But what we are seeing now is that education is not generating higher wages. In fact, since the year 2000, college-educated adults in the United States have seen their median wage drop. Recent college graduates have seen a striking decline in their wages, adjusted for inflation. What's going on? Can't be just education. Well, again, a big part of it is that we've, we're beginning to see technological displacement of knowledge workers as well as others, symbolic analysts as well as others. It is just beginning. The ratio of employers, or employees, I should say, to customers around the world economy is dropping dramatically. In the 1950s, 60s, 1970s, we had mass production for mass consumption. We had a production system that needed a lot of people. Most of those people were either in unions or they were the beneficiaries of unionized workers' negotiations, setting prevailing wages. But that has all eroded. Now what we are seeing increasingly is not mass production for mass consumption. We're seeing now, through the magic of technology, very small numbers of people capable of generating huge productivity increases and huge numbers of customers. When Facebook bought WhatsApp, last year for $19 billion, $19 billion, WhatsApp had not 1,000 employees, not 10,000 employees, WhatsApp had 55 employees, serving almost 500 million customers. Now contrast that with the companies of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Once you get to ratios like that, where you have something like $19 billion for a company with 55 employees, 
and 500 million customers, you are in a different world than mass production for mass consumption. Now, extrapolate from that into the future. Suppose that I came up with a little invention called an I everything. And what you could do with this little I everything, you have to imagine it in my hand, is that you could treat it as something like a modern Aladdin's lamp. You could say to the I everything, I would like blank, and whatever you wanted, the I everything could provide it. Whether it was 3D manufactured, or however it came to you, that I everything would create it and deliver it by drone, you would have it within seconds at your feet. It would be the kind of world, the kind of economy that the great famed British economist John Maynard Keynes in 1928 predicted that in a hundred years technology would have obviated the need for labor. We would all be in this wondrous world in which we could essentially have everything we wanted and anything we needed and would not have to work. He predicted that in 1928. Presumably we're 13 years away from that prophecy. We don't know whether it will happen. But if you contemplate an I everything, that sounds like it's pretty close, except for one big problem. Nobody will be able to afford the I everything because nobody will have a job. Do you get my point? What Keynes forgot about, and what we have to really focus on, is the issue of distribution and redistribution. How do we move from an economy of mass production, mass consumption, where the distribution was pretty clear because workers are consumers, consumers are workers. That worked pretty well. To an economy where you have essentially a WhatsApp system where you have a handful of people generating huge value added for a gigantic number of customers to an I-everything economy in which you have essentially everything can be done almost by nobody and nobody is working but nobody has any means of buying anything. Now, obviously, this is a kind of a, 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 a dreamlike, a, a, almost a silly example, but it's not silly. That's the direction we are going in. So the distributional issue becomes very complicated. There is no way we can redistribute. I mean, the, uh, the inventors of WhatsApp, I think the fellow who is the major co-partner got about $8 billion from that transaction. We are generating huge, huge wealth for a small number of people who are lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time, come up with the right invention. But then what happens to everybody else who are pushed into the local personal service economy? That's the question we need to be addressing. It can't be just a giant tax and redistribution system. Thomas Piketty suggested a wealth tax. Uh, not only are the politics very almost impossible, but also how would you manage that? Which gets me into what I promised to get into, politics. Do you see how we got there? I don't mean politics in the kind of Democrats, Republicans politics. I mean politics in the sense of how do you actually craft a political system capable of doing the kind of redistribution that will be required when you have a system of production that really doesn't require much labor and certainly doesn't return much to many workers. Well, I think there is an easier way to approach this than massive taxes and redistribution. And I think the easier way to approach this is to look inside the black box of the political economy. 
WhatsApp would not be worth $19 billion if our patent system, instead of awarding patent for 20 years or more, awarded a patent for three years. WhatsApp would not be worth $19 billion if we had an antitrust system that was much more vigorously concerned than it now apparently is about standard platforms that can become very powerful monopolies. WhatsApp would not be worth $19 billion if, in other words, the market were organized in slightly different ways. I'm not suggest that patent protection go from 20 to three years. I'm not suggested that suggesting that antitrust enforcement uh, be recalibrated. I'm just suggesting for you that we cannot have a market unless decisions are made about the meaning and duration of property, market power, and so on. These are political choices and political decisions. Are you still with me? I'm trying to read your faces and body language. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. All right. You're still there. All right. No, that's okay. Uh, so here's where I'm going. Uh, suppose we were to think about taking, for example, and this is a, this is a way out idea, but I, I want us to, you to be, and I think all of us to be thinking out of the box in this kind of a way. Suppose we were to say, instead of reducing patent protection from 20 years to three years, what we'll do is we will have a fund uh, that the receipts, the revenues from the awarding of patents, uh, maybe 20% of them, or some percentage of them, will go into a fund, that fund will be automatically distributed on a per capita, per person basis to everybody in our society, in a particular nation, when they reach 18, a minimum basic income. Not so high that they don't have an incentive to work, but high enough that they actually can survive and can buy and purchase and be part of an economy. We could have a conversation about a lot of ways to do this. I want to just suggest to you that it's not all about taxing and redistributing. It's about reformulating the rules of the market to accommodate a very different world that we will be in. Now, a sign just went up saying 10 minutes to end, which I gather is 10 minutes until I really have to leave, which I mean and I gather is, we have to turn to questions now. Uh, so I really, I, I want to have your questions and I encourage you. Yes, please. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark Stallman, the president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life. Uh, Max Weber's uh, Spirit of Capitalism is Protestant Ethic. As you know, um, more or less at the same time, Hilary Belloc wrote The Servile State, um, which was not a Protestant ethic, but it sounds to me like you're talking about distributism, uh, which was a very big deal in the 20s and 30s. I'm sure you know a lot about it. Could you please contrast what you're talking about with distributism? Uh, well, distributism in the 20s and 30s was really a follow-on to Henry George, uh, Progress and Poverty. I mean, the big, big issue in the 19th century, as you know, I'm sure, is that land values were going up, but only a few people had a lot of land. And the question was, how do you re redistribute that land, those land values? And Henry George said, you just have a single tax. It was like a capital gains tax. And use that single tax, that capital gains tax, for public improvements. It was kind of a marriage of Henry Clay's 1920, 1820s system with what you were talking about in terms of the redistribution of uh, ideas of the 20s and 30s. Uh, I don't think anybody has, at any given historical point in time, a perfect answer to how to deal with uh, extraordinary capital gains because of either technological shifts or because of shifts demographically. Uh, but we have to deal with them, and particularly in the context of the technological changes, the knowledge replacing technologies that we are on the cusp of seeing. So 
What they said, what Henry George said might have been applicable and I think was a pretty good idea in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Uh, some of the, uh, well, Edward Bellamy would be another one who I would add to my list. Uh, and uh, Edward Bellamy had a lot to say about some of this. Uh, but you see, all of them were responding to uh, challenges that are much smaller than the challenges we are now dealing with. Okay, yes, I, I'm uh, Ian McInnes from Syracuse University. I uh, teach uh, information economics there. Uh, so what I'm wondering about with respect to your uh, minimum income, which we've talked about earlier today, uh, is, is the uh, aspect of the global labor market and migration and, and the fact that people will migrate to countries and, and how you kind of arrange things around that basis, like how you deal with uh, a minimum income when there is migration. Uh, well, the, the only, uh, the, the migration issue is not just an issue with regard to uh, a distributional problem in the United States. That is a migration, even if we had exactly the same uh, distribution of income we have in the United States now, where median wages are leveling off or decline, declining, household income, median household income is declining, we still would fa have a big migration issue. I mean, uh, Europe has very high unemployment. Uh, Europe wage, European wages, particularly in Southern Europe, are actually on the decline in real adjusted inflation adjusted terms. And yet, look at the, mi the migration issues that they are dealing with. Uh, we are, you are raising a demographic issue as well as an economic issue. I mean, the developed countries are all aging very, very fast. And I'd include China. Uh, we have, at the other end, we have developing economies that have huge numbers of young people, and they are relatively poor. Even if we didn't have Syria and uh, the, the crises in the Middle East, uh, we would still have developing economies with very, a lot of very, very young people who are very ambitious. Uh, well, how do you square aging economies that are getting old with developing economies that are very young? The answer is migration. It's inevitable. I mean, the United States has a leg up on other nations because we are a nation of immigrants. We know how to do it. We assimilate. You're asking the marginal increase in incentives to migrate to places that have the kind of redistribution that I am talking about. Well, yes, there would be some, but Europe is a much more redistributionist set of countries than the United States right now. Uh, so again, given all of the tumult, I don't see that as a central issue. We're still going to be facing those, those problems. Yes, I, I don't know who's... I want to pick up on your... Michael Davies from MIT, uh, London Business School. I want to pick up on your comments on the patent system. Um, and throw out a couple of facts and get your response. There were no patents in the WhatsApp deal. Zip, none, nada. There haven't been any in a whole bunch of the other multi-billion dollar deals that go down because they've proven to be useless. I've been spending much of the last two years embroiled in the middle of the smartphone patent wars, and all they've done so far is generate at least hundreds of millions, possibly a billion dollars worth of transaction cost to no net redistributive effect. Uh, other than keeping a lot of lawyers in Washington, D.C., richer and happier. Um, is there actually any value in the patent system whatsoever? Well, of course there is. I mean, intellectual property depends on patents and trademarks. Now, you may say, uh, and it is true with regard to certain kinds of patents or certain kinds of industries, uh, the intellectual capital is is there regardless of the patent and trademark, but if anybody can easily copy, if anybody can take the messaging system of WhatsApp and reproduce it uh, for zero cost, uh, then WhatsApp has a problem. Now, it may not be a patent issue, it may be a different form of barrier to entry, but whatever the barrier to entry is, I don't care, we could talk about any in the individual uh, context, any individual technology. There has to be, there is a barrier to entry. You get, don't get 10, $19 billion of value without any barrier to entry. 
So if it's not patent protection, then it's antitrust that you want to look at. I mean, in other words, in other words, you can't have a business model without a barrier to entry because somebody else is going to simply take and reproduce, particularly when the costs of reproduction are so low. Right? Yes? No? Well, you have network effects, but network effects also are subject to antitrust scrutiny. That's what Europe is now doing with regard to Google. That's what the Federal Trade Commission was up to with regard to its investigation of Google and its reinvestigation of Google. Network effects create huge market power. Huge market power is remediable if you want to remedy it. Now, that's a very complicated question. Do you want to remedy it? But if market power is quote unquote excessive and leading to potentially predatory behavior or generating the kinds of profits, $19 billion of wealth, Maybe there's a role for either antitrust or some other form of anti-monopoly pursuit. That's all I'm saying. And so if there is, you have in the market and in the legal system some means of changing the distribution. You don't have to go outside. In other words, we, we tend to... We tend to think only in terms of taxing and redistributing, rather than looking at the innards of the market and saying, wait a minute, there are, way, there are pre-distributions going on. I mean, look at, for example, why is it the United States right now has the highest internet service provider rates of any advanced nation, and at the same time the slowest internet of any advanced nation? Is that just an accident? No, it's not an accident. It's because 80% of Americans have no choice of internet service provider. And if you have no choice, there's no competition by definition. And if there's no competition, you're going to be paying through the nose. Pharmaceuticals in this country. We're paying more for pharmaceuticals than anybody else around the advanced world. Why? Because of the combination of patents and also the legal permissiveness in this country, not in other countries, of paying off generic producers so that they do not have the opportunity to come on stream with their generic productions. Hi, my question is, um, we had some great ideas about um, basic incomes and whatnot, but, and very theoretical ideas, but you had a very practical position as U.S. Secretary of Labor. Can you talk about some of the, I assume, struggles that you've had with um, getting these, anything like this through um, the Clinton administration? Uh, well, there's a continuous political struggle. I mean, even raising the minimum wage uh, is a continuous political struggle because you've got particular industries, uh, the National Retail Federation and the uh, National Restaurant Association, the NRA, not the NRA, the other NRA, the actual NRA uh, that doesn't want the minimum wage increased, obviously, uh, for reasons that are completely explicable, uh, they will fight. Uh, they would fight uh, any kind of a change in either patents, laws, or antitrust, scrutiny, or anything else we're talking about. Uh, but at some point, the game has to change, and it does change. Uh, let me step back and introduce something that I never expected I'd introduce at this session, but I will say it anyway. The reason that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, who don't really deserve to be in the same sentence, <laughs> uh, are both surging is because it's not just an anti-political year we are in, but it's an anti-establishment year. If you look at the surveys, most Americans feel like the game is rigged, politically and economically. You want the game rigged? Is that why you're applauding? <laughs> and when you have a large number of people beginning to think that the game is rigged, what you have is 1900. That is, 1900 is the year where you had a tipping point, because you had a gilded age and robber barons and squalor in terms of poverty, and you had the lackeys of the robber barons literally putting stacks of money on the desks of pliant legislators. In other words, you had a situation that in some ways 
is analogous to today. And then you had a progressive rejection because you had an upswell of public anger at that system that seemed so dissonant with the ideals of American democracy. Well, you're right now beginning, we're beginning to see that. And that, that upsurge of populist anger can either take one turn, I mean, in other cultures, at other times historically, it's gone to authoritarianism. Or it can turn, as it usually does in the United States, certainly did in the 1830s, in the 19, between 1901 and 1916, uh, in the 1930s, uh, in the 1960s to some extent, uh, toward fundamental reform. But it's the anti-establishment energy that is the vehicle, politically, for what you are talking about. That's actually where fundamental change comes from. It's coming. A lot more now, yes. It's a lot more now because inequality is much bigger than it was, because many more Americans are now convinced the game is rigged, because since 2008 and the bailout of Wall Street, you have both the Tea Party and the brief Occupy movement, and they are still living. The embodiments of both are Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And what we're seeing is a rejection of the people who are represented in people's minds to be the ruling class, the old ruling class, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. Now, I say this, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in a kind of awkward position. I've known Hillary Clinton since she was 19 years old. I was in the Clinton administration. I don't like to think of me as part of the ruling class. <laughs> but what I'm just talking about is, is political attitudes have shifted very, very rapidly. So when you ask what is the realm of political possibility, the realm of political possibility is very different and will be over the next 10 years than it has been over the last 20. And the next sign says, end. So I'm going to have to end. I hope this is helpful. Thank you very, very much, all of you.